KFSR and CMAC present the Central Valley Ledger, a public affairs program featuring stories from all over the Central Valley with Sivag Tediosian, 90.7 KFSR. I'm your host, Sevog Tatiosian. Welcome to the Central Valley Ledger here on the beautiful Fresno State campus. We're actually inside Studio A of the Mass Communication and Journalism Department. And we're here with Mary Gantbell. She is a local writer. She has her own show. And so welcome to the program. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're welcome. And before we get into one of the reasons I asked you here is because you actually wrote, produced, directed, and put together your own movie, which I thought audience members would be very interested in learning the process on. But before we get there, tell us about yourself. <laughs> That's the $90 million question. <laughs> what do you say when somebody says, tell me about yourself? I mean, in a lot of ways, I'm just this average American person just kind of hanging out <laughs> doing my thing. Um, and But my friends have always said to me, like, you know, once Mary puts her mind to something, she's going to do it. So in that regard, I would say to people, you know, if you have an idea, if you have a curiosity, if you have a desire, make it happen, you know? And that's all I did. I mean, there's nothing special about me that I was able to do this. I, it was just determination. You have volunteered on several programs over at CMAC, mm -hmm. and so in the studio now, we have Fresno State students yes. behind the cameras and in the booth. Is it, is it a good thing that they're doing this, and what should they take out of this volunteer experience? Oh, absolutely. It's a great way to get experience. It's a great way to learn where, where your passion lies. You know, are you excited about working in the control room or are you just doing your time? Are you excited about being in front of the camera, behind the camera? Are you more motivated to write or produce or direct? And being a volunteer, you can try out all of those parts and then see which one is the one that calls to you the most. And you get all kinds of experience and all. And plus, I also think that, let's say that, for example, um, directing is what really really floats your boat and that's what you decide you want to do well you can be a better director by having learned all of the other pieces and knowing you know okay i've got this great idea for a scene but if you've been on the other side of the camera you know what it's going to take to make that scene happen and whether or not it's realistic you know and by the way thank you and amanda because you two <laughs> have volunteered on this program before you are great to work for. We love to do your show. Thank you. So you have your own show. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your own show. So my show at CMAC was um, called There's an Oil for That. And it was I, I um, use and sell and teach people about therapeutic grade essential oils as a way to get a natural um, physical health, emotional health, spiritual health that's drug free, prescription free, and all natural. So I decided that, you know, a lot of times I meet people who want to get healthy and they go to the, you know, the doctor and they come to me and they say, I had this test, that test, this drug, that drug, and nothing worked. I know I'm not crazy. I know I don't feel well and I want to feel well. I want to be 100%. And so using all the all natural options and getting all that synthetic stuff out of their body. So I wanted to teach people that there's other options. You know, if Western medicine doesn't do it for you, there are other options. You don't just have to sit there and accept the fact that they couldn't find something wrong, so I must be crazy. Now, you might be crazy, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know. How hard was it to put this whole thing together? Not hard at all, because the CMAC staff was always there and always available. And one of the great things about CMAC is when I volunteer for your show, and so I volunteer for other shows and help other people, so when I need help with my show, they reciprocate. And they'll come and then I put out a call and say, help, and they answer, so. And so we're here because I have been involved, for the record, I have been involved. You're my in, brother. Uh, yes, I'm your brother in this movie <laughs> that you've written, and I wear this red wig. So if people don't recognize me, it's because of the wig and the beanie that I put on. Yes. Um, tell us where this came from, because I remember that <laughs> One day I was talking to you and you said, I'm going to put this thing together. Do you want to be a part of it? And I said, yes. And then within a week, you were ready to go. So <laughs> when people say Mary puts her mind on something and does it, I believe that. But where did 
you know, why put a movie together? Why not? I mean, I just, there was something that I felt I wanted to say and kind of born out of a little bit of a personal situation and a little bit of a frustration. And I thought, why not? I am making this other show about oils and I'm teaching people things and I, um, I'm loving it. It's fun. And I was having a good time. And I felt that what I felt I needed to say, some people will write a book, some people write poetry, some people write music. And I felt like what I have to say, other people could relate to. And it just, instead of one of those other options, because nobody wants to read my poetry, I guarantee you that. <laughs> So, so it turned into a movie. First step in making this movie, what was it for you? Having the idea and being passionate about it. Okay, so you have the idea, mm -hmm. you're passionate about it. Mm -hmm. At some point it needs to be on paper or right. somewhere, right? Right. So how did you write it? I started out with just kind of an outline. I started out with, you know, what are the key points I wanted to make? So when the movie's over and my audience is watching the credits roll, what did I want them to take away from it? And then how do I make the characters such that, that the audience sees that? In a second, we're going to put a poster with all the yeah, different I made cast a poster. and with all the different cast members up on the screen so our audience members watching it sees. How did you come up with the people to be a part of this movie? I mean, how did you know that we need seven actors, let's say? I didn't, <laughs> to tell you the truth. I just kind of started with, um, I want a personality that projects this. I want a character that projects you know, this other thing. And then kind of said, well, how many of them are gonna be married? Will the spouses, what will the spouses contribute? And do I need any, like episode one had how many of us? There were four, quite a, yeah, we have yeah. four families. Episode two has a new character that ones and in episode one that I felt added a new dimension. And as you're talking, we're putting up on screen the different pictures with the different scenes. Now, a lot of this happened in your backyard, as we see now with the fountain, and as we see now. Oh, look, with, there's the wig. <laughs> there's the wig. Oh, and, I love the wig. So a lot of this happened at your house. Mm -hmm. So was it hard to find a place to video? Yes. Locations were very difficult to find. Finding a location that fit the scene, fit the character, had the right lighting, had the right sound, you know, and had the right um, availability. I mean, there are some places where you think, oh, that would be perfect, uh, but we really can't. How do we practically? One of the places that we ended up shooting that everybody just kind of looked at me and said, oh, good luck with that, was I wanted to do some scenes. Um, this might kind of give away the script a little bit, but. I wanted to do some scenes in the hospital because one of our family members, our sister had a little tragedy in her family and you know she needed to use a hospital. And I said, oh, where can I find a hospital that will let me just use a room? And everybody kind of said, oh, yeah, all right, good luck. But Mary puts her mind to something. <laughs> and the next thing you know, we're at Valley Children's Hospital in a room and they're letting us shoot there. So. And so how does, what does that process look like? Do you just, pick up the phone and say, you know, I'm so-and-so and I'm shooting a movie and I want to use your room. How hard was that? I can't give up my secrets because <laughs> there might be business owners out there that I want to hit yeah, up and say, yeah. you know, I can't give away all of my secrets. But no, it was not hard at all. Um, you know, people are good and people want to be helpful. And I think that, you know, when you go into a place and you be very considerate and respectful of their business. I had other businesses. We did um, shoots in other business locations. And you be respectful to them and you show them that, you know what, I want to make your business look good too. Not just make my actors look good. And you know, it works, Every, everybody benefits. So it was fun. How long did it take you to write your first script? And how many times did you edit it? <laughs> okay, how, many, how long did it take me to write the first script which was an hour long, um, probably three hours. How long did it take me to edit it? Um, when I'm done, I'll let you know. Because <laughs> remember the other day when we were shooting your parts and I said, you know, we're shooting right now, we're in post in production and post-production of parts two, three, four, five, and six. 
And remember I said to you, oh, did you know that your brother Bradley is a lawyer? We didn't know that. When I wrote part one, I didn't know he was a lawyer. So you're kind of changing it as you go. Well, I kind of set it up that he was a particular person. I mean, it went more for his personality, that I needed somebody who was just business, business, work, work. Nothing comes before my work. And then it kind of evolved that later in episodes, I needed a lawyer. <laughs> so... <laughs> How hard has it been to find actors for this? Because, you know, you've had several roles and, mm -hmm. you know, it's a non-pay position. We have fun, believe it or not. You know, we have a great time, but it's a non-pay position. So were you surprised? Very surprised. And how hard was it to find people? I was very surprised that I was able to get as many people as I did to commit their time and their energy. It was humbling, to tell you the truth because I just didn't feel like, you know, everybody would say, oh, Mary, of course we verbally support you and, you know, good job, but to actually give up <laughs> a Saturday, you know, to actually, you know, bring props, you know, to actually participate um, in a, you know, open their homes. You know, Amy and her husband opened, um, Amy, her real life name, um, opened up her home, you know, and I was there probably 12 hours one day, ended up staying the evening, having dinner with her family and everything. So, you know, it, it's difficult to ask people. And at the same time, it was easy as pie because so many people were willing and, and you know, it was fun. So if you ask the right people and they're, they're motivated to want to do it, again, it's a win-win for everybody. So you did the first you did the first, you wrote the first episode. The day that you had your viewing, how did you feel? Truth? Truth. Um, We're talking okay. truth because, okay. you know, and I hate to interrupt <laughs> you, but because there are people listening now who may want to write their own script and may want to learn all these things that come with actually making your own film. I mean, you know, truth be told, you actually did your own writing, filming, uh, editing and it's up the video is up right and so I was all done and we had the movie poster and scheduled a, you know the first release date we scheduled the cast viewing party and I invited you know the cast to invite whoever they wanted to come and I invited a few other you know CMAC friends honestly that day I didn't even watch the movie by that point, <laughs> I was like so tired of hearing it. And there was a point in the editing process where you're editing, it's going good, life is good, like, oh, this is so much fun. And then all of a sudden, you just reach a point where it's like, I've looked at this so many times, I'm bored with my own self. So, and then you kind of get your groove again, and you, you get back into the, the process of it and, and the fun of it, and, and you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But, um, you know, when I went to the cast party and showing it for the first time to everybody else, I wasn't all that concerned about what everybody else thought of it. I mean, I wasn't nervous about like, oh, will anybody like it? Will anybody watch it? Because I felt like it will appeal to some people and it won't appeal to others. And I'm just not going to worry about the others. So if it speaks to, if it ministers to one person, it's good. What do you want to convey with this film? I think the biggest thing that I want to convey with this film is um, that it's important in life to look at situations from the other person's point of view. So many times we get wrapped up in how we feel about things or we look at a situation and we say, well, obviously that's what happened. From the other person's perspective, that might not be so obvious. So in, in my movie, the, all of the characters are exaggerated and hopefully to a point that's comical. But it kind of helps you see that, you know what, what I saw, you can put 10 people in a room, have them all watch the exact same thing happen, and they will have 10 different perspect perspectives about what they saw. None of them are wrong. You know, they're all right. But you, are, you have to be able to see things from the other side of the fence. So <clears throat> in my movie, it's a family of four siblings and their spouses. But these types of characters, we run into them not only in our own family, we run into them in work situations. We run into them in, you know, your kid's soccer team. You know, there's, there's 
personalities in every, every time you put a group of people together. So I'm hopeful that, that when you watch my movie that you'll be able to say, oh, I didn't know it looked like, when I do stuff like that, I didn't know it looked like, like that from the other side. Tell us about the different businesses that have been welcoming. I mean, you were at a diner, you were at Valley Children's. I mean, tell us about them a little bit. So we did Valley, Valley Children's, and they were very cooperative and very, very accommodating, and I found out that the guy that helped me there was also a CMAC member. Oh, so we kind of had it. Yeah, it kind of worked out that it way. It did. It was nice. And then also um, Sweet Del Delicates. It's a bakery shop in Old Town Clovis, and we went there and used their. They have a nice little. It's cute, and they, oh, they have such good bakery. <laughs> um, so we went there and we did a shoot there. Two of the sisters went and had a, a sister Sunday uh, meet up instead of all these individual shoots. And then the other um, business that has helped me was a tro I needed some B-roll stuff of a trophy shop. And so I went in the trophy shop and he let me move all this stuff all over the shelves. It was very accommodating. And then uh, the other one is um, Nick's Dog Service. So <laughs> this is another thing where you talk about the story evolving. So at one point, so we have these four siblings. And at one point, somebody said, well, what's our last name? I said, well, I don't know. I had never thought about it before. And so one of the characters, actually, your wife has two great Danes. So I decided, you know, in about episode four or five that our last name is going to be Dane and that she bought great Danes because she married a man <laughs> named Dane. So you can kind of, you know, have some fun with it along the way. It doesn't have to be a set in stone. You know, once you get the idea, you don't have to stay in that narrow focus. You can play with it as you get a little glitter here as you need to. So anyway, so Nick, I called up Nick and he is a dog trainer and he boards dogs and babysits if you're on vacation and stuff. And I called up Nick and I said, do you, you don't happen to have a client who has a Great Dane that I could borrow, do you? And he said, well, I have a Great Dane. Perfect timing. Exactly, so I called him up and said, you know, can I use your Great Dane and went over to his house. And, and since he's a dog trainer, I was like, well, I want your dog to do this, 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 and, and he's like, no problem. I'm a trainer, and that dog was just sweet as could be. So, that's exciting to know <laughs> that all these things are coming up in the future uh, editions. Now, the, part one is called the decision, but yes. they never really get to what the decision is. They Why is that? They don't even say what the decision is about, because I want people to see the way that they communicate, not get wrapped up. If I would have named what the decision was about, then people might have gotten caught, stuck in that issue. You know, I didn't want the issue to be the issue. I wanted the communication, the miscommunication, the lack of communication to be what called to people. Well, and so people are probably wondering now what the what this is about what the story is about so tell us a little bit about what the story is about well to me it's about communication and how different types of personalities communicate or don't communicate but it's interesting to me because everybody who watches it um, tells me they, that they connected with a different character and so they felt that the movie was something completely different and everybody I talk to says, oh, well, I thought the movie was about this, or I thought the movie was about that, which is exactly what I wanted to kind of happen. So During the filming of the movie, we, we were filming my scenes. There were a couple of times we had, we had to change things around because of the spa and the noise the spa was making. What happened there? And the birds. And the birds. <laughs> what happened in those cases, and why? What, do you, what advice do you have for someone that encounters stuff like that? Be flexible and don't give up, you know? If you have a scene that you're just so married to it being in this spot and nowhere else, then do a whole lot of pre-production. Plan ahead, make sure that you know it, go and check the sun angles and you know like there were a couple of scenes too that when I was editing and putting them all together um, my character was at home in her pajamas and the scene before her and the scene after her were in broad daylight so I had to go back and reshoot so that she didn't look like a total 
you know, dork in their pajamas <laughs> in the middle of the day. <laughs> and what was the spa doing and what was the, what were the birds doing that kind of threw you off? Well, the, the birds were just plain loud. <laughs> <laughs> they were really loud right above your head, I remember. And the spa too, the motor noise in the background. I mean, since the way that the equipment that I use, I don't have the editing ability to, to edit out certain soundtracks. You get all the sound or you get nothing at all. So plus it makes it really hard when the birds chirping away and um, their cats were walking behind you that it makes it difficult to edit because you have the potential of a bird going chirp, chirp, chirp. Or you, you know, you, you might want to cut, you cut you off in, in, at the end of a sentence, but where was the bird saying? Or, you know, all of a sudden the cat might just disappear in the middle of your sentence. So those kinds of things, if those things really matter to you as a, as a director and a producer, then you really need to do a whole lot of pre-planning and a whole lot of controlling. Me, I'm more flexible. You know, I just kind of like to see, you know, there were some things like we were shooting your scenes and it was like, I'd stop the camera and say, wait a minute, I just had an idea, you know, that I hadn't thought about ahead of time, but it worked. So for me, the whole perfection thing, it limits you, it limits me. When I come up with those ideas on the fly or my actors come up with ideas on the fly and suggestions, it's more limiting than, um, some people call it organized. <laughs> <laughs> How important is feedback from the cast and from the people involved? Because you know, when you're dealing with seven, 10, 15 people, we all kind of have our way of thinking, right. and I know that you've been great in listening to feedback from mm -hmm. others. So how important is that, and when do you draw the line and say, you know what, this is my project and I want to do it a certain way? That's a very good question, and I think that it, it again, it kind of goes back to that flexibility and, you know, just how married you are to the script. Um, you know, there's certain things that I really feel driven to say, and then there are other little details that you feel like, well, I could go either way about that. And so it's been great. I've been very, very fortunate that everybody that I've had in my cast, when they come up with an idea and say, what if I do this and what if I do that? And I say, well, but then that doesn't fit with the scene somebody else did. They'll say, okay, no worries. And they're not the kind of people, uh, you know, I've been so lucky. They're not the kind of people that will say, you are gonna change the scene because I want you to. So it's been, um, it's been a collaboration, but it's also been a very, um, I think, from my perspective, a very smooth flowing kind of give and take. And, um, uh, but I do think that as a director and as a producer, you know, you kind of have to say, this is kind of the general broad line. I, wa I want this character to be this type of a person. And as long as the actor stays within those parameters in their, in their flexibility or you know their their input you know you can't say okay this is the character and then have them want to shoot off out there so do you care what people think of the video I mean I know we've had this discussion of are you producing what you want to put on video or are you producing what the audience wants to see and there are two ways to think about mm -hmm. that in what you're doing do you care what the audience thinks of your work well, when it comes to the there's an oils about that show, I absolutely do because I want it to be educational. If what if I'm not answering the people's questions, then what's the point? In my movie, not so much. That's an entertainment value. It's not I'm not making a, any kind of a you know, a I don't know. It's yeah. less serious. It's a different a different audience whereas yes, with my oils videos, I I care more and want more feedback. I want to know what people want to learn about and whether or not what I'm, the way I'm doing it is producing the answers they're looking for. In my movie, I just want you to be entertained. Budget. You've done many episodes <laughs> and some people will think, oh, I need thousands and thousands of dollars for your, and, and I respect that yours is a little more simple mm -hmm. than some of these other movies out there, but mm -hmm. yours has, intros and exits, music and stuff like that. So uh, talk about the budget and if people should be held up on a project like this because of budget. Absolutely not. I mean, I <clears throat> if you're not doing 
a project just because of the budget there are always ways to find um, ways to do it for free I mean all of my cast is volunteer um, we, all of the equipment that I used I either have it myself or it's I have it through CMAC so it, that didn't cost me anything or the props I have like all of my actors use their own clothing for costumes all of the props that I had are stuff either I had or my actors had laying around the house um, you know when I was filming over at uh, Amy's house you know I, I wanted a Superman cape you know and I was like well do you just happen to have a super oh absolutely we have a Superman cape you know do you happen to have this you happen to have that you, you know can we shoot Amy cooking supper um, and you know and all of it she's like oh sure pulls out all the groceries and you know makes it look like she's so I didn't have to provide all of that and I think in a lot of times um, if you don't get the right actors who are willing to do that kind of thing then it makes it a lot tougher but I mean honestly I'm shooting all I mean if you just kind of want to know a ballpark I'm shooting all six episodes like less than a hundred bucks and that's incredible because you're able to find volunteers and places to shoot that are not charging you but you've kept it simple so I don't want mm -hmm. to mislead the audience members and thinking that you're making this massive production with a lot of props and stuff there's no action there's no stunt doubles there's <laughs> no but it's the important thing here is it's you actually following through writing filming editing and showing and so I think that's the most important thing wouldn't you agree I do, I do think so. And I say that, you know, I did the whole production, all six ep episodes for under $100, but probably a whole lot more hours than 100 <laughs> Yeah, well, if you count your hours and you charge hourly. That's the problem, don't do that. Don't count your hours, <laughs> just kind of, you know, but actually, I mean, I enjoy each, each step of the process, the writing of the script, the shooting, um, you know, the editing. I, I loved each step of the process was fun, so. Mary, thank you so much for coming Thanks on the program, and I hope that our audience members learned a little bit from your project. That's all for this edition of the Central Valley Ledger. I'm your host, Sevog Tatiosian. Thank you to our guest, Mary Gantbell, who is here and talking about her production that she wrote, edited, filmed, and produced herself. Thank you to our volunteers here in the studio. We're in the Mass Communication and Journalism Department's Studio A at the beautiful Fresno State Campus. They're here in the studio making us look and sound good. Thank you to our audience members listening to this broadcast on KFSR 90.7 FM. We hope that you enjoyed this program and also to our viewers who are watching this on Comcast 93 and AT&T 99. Tune in next week to a new edition. KFSR and CMAC present the Central Valley Ledger every Sunday morning at 1130. For complete program schedule, visit KFSR.org.